Joining me is Kelly Campagna over at Daily Wire, same place uh, that is famous in particular for Ben Shapiro. Uh, she has a big following on Twitter, over 100,000, actually over 105,000 followers there. She handles uh, social media for the Daily Wire and really does a great job. I've been looking through her Twitter feed. Kelly, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Well, I want to start, Twitter seems to be your main thing, or at least that stands out from my research about you. And I found it very interesting, kind of inspiring, that you start off with your um, pinned tweet is something from 2015, and uh, it's from an abortion survivor. And so that's clearly a very important issue to you, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Well, basically, in, in 2015, uh, that, was, that tweet is from September. Um, that was about the time that uh, the the sting operation was going on. The undercover people uh, were finding out all the information about Planned Parenthood selling baby body parts. Right. And as somebody who was kind of, you know, on the fence about abortion, you know, kind of a, more of a Republican, you know, I know it's bad, but I'm not really passionate about the issue. Um, watching those videos was like a huge moment, like a watershed moment for me seeing, oh, that's what abortion actually is. Really? You know, Really? Wait, kind you know of, what? I don't want to go through all your other tweets. I want to dwell on this. We're just getting to know each other. We've never talked to each other before. That's really interesting. Mm-hmm. I just guessed, came to a con- made an assumption that you've just always been very conservative that way. So that really is what got you. Yeah, well, I, I was conservative before that, but abortion never was a really particularly important issue for me. Uh-huh. Um, it, I'm a very, very visual-oriented person, and so seeing the actual body parts laying in the Petri dish is much more, I mean, I, I know it's graphic, but I feel like it's very important uh, for people that are, you know, that are on the edge or on the fence uh, regarding that issue to actually see it. If you're on the fence, you need to actually see and realize what you're on the fence about. And that that's basically what turned my, my attention. It was about, you know, late summer 2015 that made me very, very pro-life. And then if you actually click the link on that pin tweet, you'll see um, an abortion survivor. She yep. actually describes her the abortion procedure that she went through, and it's a pretty powerful video. So you were basically stunned by this. You're like, wow, I can't believe it's yeah. that awful. And uh, yeah. were you the typical, not the typical, but in a lot of cities, there are, well, I'm conservative fiscally, but I'm socially liberal. And were you of that type? And then this woke you up? Um, I, I, I wouldn't say I was of that type. It's just that abortion, being a woman, I can kind of sympathize with somebody that finds themselves in the position, oh, no, I'm pregnant. I, I'd rather not be. You know, what do I do? And so I, I found myself sympathizing more so with that argument, not necessarily to say that I was for abortion, just that I was much more sympathetic to that argument, not really understanding, fully understanding, I should say, that you know, you are you are really you're actually t- you're taking a life and you're doing it in one of the most inhumane ways you possibly can. It's one of the major aspects. Again, I can't stress this enough for people that are on the fence. You need to look at, you know, if you can watch those videos and still feel comfortable with a pro-choice or even on the fence position, then you know, more power to you. But I I I have a hard time believing that people can actually look at those videos and not, you know, really understand fully. What, what is actually happening there. Here's a question that may be out of left field. I was just reading about some of the potential governors and other races in states that tend mm. to be Democratic. And it's just interesting to me when someone was pro-life, but then I guess they grow in office or grow in age, and then they suddenly become pro-choice, realizing whatever it is. What do you think about politicians like that who change their views on abortion to make themselves more electable? I think it's more about they're removing themselves from the issue. You know, again, they're not they're not looking at those kind of videos. They're not uh, associating with the reality of the situation. And it's kind of I was recently in D.C. actually, and it really is a removed area. You're kind of outside of the realm of reality. Right. And I I think that that's a lot of what happens with politicians. You know, they're not. They're not, you know, looking at, at Lila Rose's group videos, um, you know, going undercover with Planned Parenthood, actually seeing what goes on in those kinds of clinics. Um, so, I, again, I think it's, it's 
it's a matter of being so far removed and thinking, oh, well, maybe it really isn't that bad, you know. Isn't it um, ironic, sadly ironic, what has happened to the whistleblowers there, especially given how much the mm -hmm. left has celebrated whistleblowers? They were even Times Persons of the Year not that long ago. Um, right. And the way – can you catch people up on what happened to the brave people who exposed Planned Parenthood? Yeah, um, David – and I, I'm I'm so bad at pronouncing his last name. I think it's Dale again. Um, he was responsible for the particular sting operation that I'm talking about, where they went undercover and basically posed as buyers for baby body parts. And mm -hmm. Planned Parenthood is totally willing to work with them and telling them prices of the various organs and things like that. Um, and he, they, I'm, I live in California and. At the time, our uh, State Attorney General was Kamala Harris, now our beloved senator. Um, she actually had, had gone after them and targeted them. I believe his house was actually uh, raided uh -huh. by her office, and he's, uh, been, he's now going to be prosecuted. I believe he has 15 counts against him and the possib possibility of 15 years in prison for him and the other lady that was working with him. Her name escapes me at the moment, but... Um, it, it's a real travesty of justice. I, I think even the L.A. Times spoke out against this, but uh, Democrat politicians are completely fine with this. Kamala Harris is completely fine with, with the, the rife corruption of this state. It's, it's a real, sorry, state of affairs. Yeah, no, let's, uh, let's talk a, lot, a little bit about Kamala Harris, who I think, you know, the wheels are starting to turn. They're trying to make her into one of the bright young stars of uh, the Democrat Party, half black, half mm. Indian. And so she fits the bill. And uh, I just find it very curious, her whole career. And I think you know what I'm talking about, like when she was in her right. 20s. Uh, can you catch yeah. people up who are not in California about Kamala Harris and why we should watch out for her beyond what she's doing to these pretty brave people or what she started yeah. doing? Well, the, the thing about Kamala Harris is she kind of gives off this, um, somehow she's able to come off as very caring and intelligent and, um, I don't know, businesslike, because my my former employers were actually Republicans, uh -huh. and they even fell for her and thought that, oh, you know what, you know, they were, they're just average, you know, I used to work in real estate, average, you know, business-like people, and they said, looked at her commercials on TV and said, you know, she seems pretty reasonable. she That's the thing that I find dangerous about her is she's able to put on this front, even though if you go on her Twitter site or you see, you actually hear some of the crazy things that come out of her mouth, uh -huh. you know, I, I like to refer to her as three fries short of a Happy Meal. But uh, she's uh, she is able to put on this front that I think fools a lot of people, especially in the older generation. So, uh, and, and my colleague, Erin Bandler, also likes to talk about how she definitely has that identity politics um, oh, yeah. in the bag, you know. She has the Obama well, thing going, the way it seems to me. Uh, she's, got, she's got a little bit of Obama and a little bit of Hillary all, all together. So she's definitely going to be a prime candidate for 2020. Mm -hmm. Whether that actually comes to fruition or if she wins the primary, I don't know, but she's got... She's basically as close as you can get to what my boss likes to call a unicorn of intersectionality at this point. <laughs> uh, well, she not, one thing she does not have in common with Hillary is she's a little better looking. And I should probably point out to listeners that she had not really done anything great academically or shown any signs mm -hmm. of achievement. She was advanced because when she was in her 20s, she was the girlfriend of the married uh, Speaker of the General Assembly, a uh, guy named Willie Brown, and she got right. positions that she would not have gotten on her own uh, in that way. Mm. And it's just important to realize that. And I don't think there's any secret there. I mean, she never really achieved. She got put in positions, and one position often leads to another one. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not from California. No, that's that's absolutely correct. And I think that's indicative of a lot of uh, career climbing in, in the state of California. I've seen it happen in politics, and it also happens in Hollywood uh, a great deal. A lot of the Hollywood stars you'll find, uh, they either had – boyfriends that worked for yeah. specific people, now they're working for specific people, or they had spouses, or it's very ancestral in California. Um, and I, I think it's also a mistake uh, that Republicans make to disassociate uh, politics from media culture, because California is all intertwined 
it's it's a very incestuous relationship, as you can see with we elected Arnold Schwarzenegger as their governor. So it's a strange place. It is a strange place. I don't know. I'm actually reading a book right now. Uh, it's a classic, The Grapes of Wrath, and it's just funny hearing what their impressions are of California. This is in the 1930s or early 1940s, I forget which, and how it's this idealistic place, how they have this dream idea of it. And things were obviously very different, even the reality then, and what California has mm-hmm. become now. Okay, we only have about three, four more minutes. I do want to ask you about some of the things you've tweeted about, and there's so much I could ask you about, but uh, people who know the Daily Wire know that it and Ben Shapiro certainly are not blindly pro-Trump with everything. And you seem to have right. some thoughts about his upcoming Middle East trip. And I just want to give you a chance to share them. Yeah, well, to, today with his uh, with everything that's going on with with uh, the leaks that have been coming out. Yeah. I, you know, I was not a Trump supporter per se, but I just really there's accusations that he's now anti-Israel or that he's anti-Jew or this and that because there it, it is said that now the information that he allegedly leaked uh, was information given to him by uh, Israel, which is our closest ally. I really have a hard time believing that he intentionally did something to hurt Israel. I mm-hmm. I think it was another. I think it's probably another case of like for example how Joe Biden. Uh, I can't remember how long ago it was, but he said, oh, yeah, the guy who told him the nuclear football is standing right behind me. Uh, I, I think it's, it's generally with Trump, it's the same as with Biden, shooting your mouth off, you know, maybe trying to sound like a tough guy and, you know, oversharing information <laughs> that he should be sharing. Well so put. I, Very um, well put. I don't know if I 100% agree, but that's a great analogy that you just made there. Mm-hmm. And they do have a lot in common. You, you expressed that very well. Oh, boy. Except I, don't, I like Trump, so I don't want to think about that, but I, I'm afraid you may be right. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not necessarily a Trump fan, but I really want to give him the benefit of the doubt here because I just don't – I don't see malice in, in his intentions. Um, I just think he, he is kind of a bloviating personality, and that's probably what I can chalk this up to at this point without more information. One final thing that you tweeted was an article by Ben Shapiro over there at the Daily Wire. I only have a little bit of time mm-hmm. left, but it's fascinating as we're seeing this Seth Rich story re-unfold right now. And it, the title pretty much says what it's about. It's confirmation bias, anonymous sources, and leaks. What do you believe about Seth Rich and Trump's classified blabbing? And in less than mm-hmm. a minute or so, maybe you could express what your position and Ben Shapiro's position are uh, on that probably similar positions. Yeah, I definitely agree about the confirmation bias because it's just so easy to look at a source and say, oh, I agree with that, so it must be true. Um, And that's basically the the gist of what his article is about. Um, I I think it is, I I always recommend to people when you've got a point of view that you're trying, or or a story that you think is true, try to go and see if there's other sources that maybe that would traditionally disagree with you that actually back that story up. So, yeah, multiple sources I think is very important, and um, try not to just assume that things are correct based on whether you know they fit your particular narrative or not. And when in doubt, the Daily Wire is a good source for those skeptical views, I would imagine. Absolutely true. <laughs> and finally, one very simple question: What's your Twitter handle again? Uh, it's at WarriorWoman91. You can find me on Twitter. You can also find me on YouTube. I host a podcast over there, which is. Uh, pretty exciting, and uh, but my my main venue for uh, social media is definitely Twitter at Warrior Woman ninety one. Kelly Campagna, it's been great talking to you today. 